our last module. Are you still with us? We can't stress enough how important this last module is to the planning process. You should invest time and training because it will kick in with your whole team when the need arises, and it may very well be the difference between a good and a bad outcome. So, in the last module, you were challenged to write the plan. Before we go further, I want to remind you that the plan, the written document, is not as important as the planning process itself. That planning process is what introduced you to your local partners, brought strengths and weaknesses out in the open, and started a dialogue so you can understand the expertise that each partner brings to the table. Remember, it's not a good idea to just get around to exchanging business cards during the disaster. Create that relationship ahead of time through the planning process. A second take home we'd like you to remember. You must train your staff to your plan and you have to maintain familiarity with the plan for proper implementation. This module will cover some suggestions about training your staff and how to maintain your plan so it's current and as useful as possible. So you've had the right partners in the room and you've written the plan. Before we dive into training and maintenance, you need to recognize who needs to actually approve your plan. It will vary from facility to facility, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but make sure that even if your administrators, owners, operators have not been really engaged in the planning and writing process, and sometimes they're not, they will need to review the plan for themselves and sign off on it. They must know what the plan says and that their employees will do what it says. Because from a business perspective, they are accountable for those employees to execute the plan. However, who else should approve your plan? You must consult with the actual people who are expected to execute the plan. If they're not directly involved in the planning process, at the very least, please have them review the plan. If the staff does not feel that they can execute the plan, it's best to know that before you attempt to implement the plan. You may also need to get buy-in from other municipal agencies, mayors or county planners. This will vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but if your planning partners have done their job, they can also assist you with determining who else may need to approve your plan and how best it should be shared. Your team will need to decide who should get a copy of the plan and how it will be potentially stored on and off-site. Facilities may want to have electronic and paper copies of the plans stored in various locations across the property. Grab-and-go sheets can be very helpful in stressful situations when it's easy to forget some of your training. That one pager can be very helpful. Make sure that your first responders receive a copy if requested. Remember, in larger jurisdictions, there are shifts of responders, some of whom may know nothing about your facility. As an example, say that something happens at your facility in the middle of the night when there's no staff on grounds. The police officer who is dispatched would serve as incident commander. He or she may benefit greatly from being able to grab a copy of your plan as they head into the scene. As we start to think about training and plan maintenance, this is a graphic representation of the cycle of disaster preparedness. Contingency planning truly is a cycle. In Module 4, you are challenged to generate a needs list, and in Module 5, you are challenged to begin to write your plan. The star on the graphic is roughly where we are in this process. Your plan is written, but now we must train the people who are expected to respond. Make sure you realize that not everyone in your facility needs to be trained on every element in your plan. You must, however, train your staff to what their individual roles and responsibilities are to follow that plan. For example, if you have an animal escape and an education intern is supposed to direct people to a secure area, make sure that their training includes how you want them to perform that task. Then decide how you'll exercise that training. Where is the shelter for guests? How do they get information about the escape, the status of the incident as it unfolds? And how do they get the all clear once the incident is under control? They don't need to understand the drug dosages nor response strategies for your recapture team. Only after you have achieved plan approval and properly trained your responders 
can you implement your plan? Note that the cycle continues. If an incident happens and the plan is implemented during a response, an evaluation should be performed that discusses the strengths and equally or more important, the weaknesses of both your plan and your response. That allows you to identify new risks that perhaps you didn't recognize in your first planning effort. Take those lessons learned and generate those new needs like you did in Module 4. And then modify your plan to better address the hazards next time it happens. Don't ever think about planning as a one-and-done situation. We'll discuss later in the module some of the recommendations for keeping your plan as updated as possible. When it comes to training, remember your people must be trained on the portion of the plan that they are expected to implement. Identify those specific tasks, whatever they may be, and make sure that your staff knows what to do. Even if it's seemingly as simple as directing guests to a parking lot in case of an evacuation, it helps to think about the who, what, when, where, how, and why of the training. If your facility plans on creating a storm rider team, think about the types of training they will need, from animal husbandry to carpentry to any other task you expect them to do. This is why you must choose your Storm Rider team members carefully. You must also consider that the Storm Rider team members must be prepared themselves to respond. They must have their own household plans in place if they're supposed to respond at work. In the workbook, we provide some information about preparing jump packs and other tips for your response team members. As you write your plan, it's good to discuss what training exercises will be needed to implement it. Consider what actions require rehearsals, which responders need to participate with you in that training, those types of things. Evaluate what incidents are the most likely that may require more intensive training and exercises. Again, rely on your partners and preparedness to help you assess what type of training and exercises should be developed to allow you to execute your plan. There's a natural order to training and exercises. And there are courses that your staff can take that will help you to develop a robust program for your institution. The IS-120A course is offered free of charge online through FEMA's Emergency Management Institute. This course material is the basis for information in this module, but it is recommended that anyone involved in development of the training and the exercise program for your facility should take the actual course. The IS-120 course will introduce you to the Homeland Security Exercise and Evaluation Program, or HSEEP. HSEEP was created specifically to provide some consistency in the development, the conduct, and the documentation of exercises. A good training exercise program is both discussion and action-oriented, where you increase complexity over time. Remember that old adage? You have to learn to walk before you can run? Well... A good training exercise program is much the same. Once you've trained your staff, start with a discussion-based simple exercises. Then over time, try to ascend to action-based or more complex incidents involving multiple stakeholders in a simulated incident. Talk to your planning partners and first responders about getting involved in their training and exercises in your area. Once you have some basic ICS knowledge, then getting involved, even as just an observer in a local exercise, will be very valuable for anyone developing a training exercise program at their own facility. FEMA has developed a nice graphic which shows the different types of training exercises, both discussion-based and action-oriented. We'll get into some of the details in a moment, but note that you increase capability as responders as it becomes more complicated with your exercises. You don't want to dive into a full-scale exercise without doing some of the less complicated training and exercises first. Remember, walk before you run. Let's start with an introduction to discussion-based training and exercises. Seminars can be a first step in training to your plan. A seminar is uh, discussion-based and it can be an orientation to your plan. It allows for common understanding to be developed as you progress in your training program. It can include your facility personnel, but also may include first responders. Typically utilizes an instructor, a trainer, or a teacher to lead that seminar. An example of a training seminar may involve your animal capture team and your local police force to discuss firearms equipment. Workshops are a more formal discussion and all those invited are expected to participate rather than simply being students. Workshops are a great way to develop new ideas, new processes, or procedures to implement your plans. Goals of training workshops are to gain consensus 
and to collect or share information. Workshops may focus on one area of your plan or the plan as a whole. A written product or protocol should be the outcome of a workshop, such as an approved animal escape protocol where roles and responsibilities of your escape team and your local police are documented in writing. Tabletop exercises are still discussion-based, but things are beginning to get a bit more complex. Although still discussion-based, a tabletop is more in-depth to identify specific strengths and weaknesses in the plan. A tabletop should enhance understanding of new concepts. An experienced exercise facilitator is required for a tabletop, and the design of the exercise should include what are called injects, which are intentional stumbling blocks in the path you initially chose to force you to get creative and consider alternatives to your initial response plan. Tabletops are slow paced to allow problem solving as you move through the exercise. For example, your written plan is to use Interstate Highway A for evacuation and the inject challenge might be that Highway A is impassable forcing you to identify alternative escape routes. Another inject example might be that the planned emergency animal food source has also been damaged and closed. In tabletop exercises, you must define another strategy for food acquisition or animal evacuation or alternative available foods. Several successful tabletop exercises have been developed and conducted to prepare zoological institutions for highly pathogenic avian influenza. Take a look at the ZAHP Fusion Center website for more information on Flu at the Zoo. It's a tabletop exercise that's already been performed by some of your colleagues. Games can be a great way to get the training accomplished while engaging some friendly competition. It's also a discussion-based training that can allow you to conduct what-if scenarios of your existing plans. Games don't involve actual mobilization of resources, Game simulations are used quite a bit in industrial safety training. Operations-based exercises such as drills, functional exercises, and full-scale exercises are more complex and actually require action of some sort on the part of the participants and may require some resource mobilization. Drills are the first type of exercise on that FEMA scale where the participants are actually required to do more than just discuss the plan. We're all familiar with fire drills. These are operations based. You hear the alarm, you stop your work, perhaps you lock your office and then proceed to your designated meeting space. Drills are designed to allow you to actively practice and maintain your existing skills. Drills are a great way to break down elements of a more complex exercise to follow into simpler pieces to be individually evaluated and improved. The physical practice reinforces training, strengthens that muscle memory, so things become more automatic in terms of your training. A functional exercise is a single or multi-agency activity designed to evaluate capabilities and multiple functions simultaneously using a simulation. You essentially create a simulated deployment. You don't fire weapons or practice loading animals in crates, but you do walk through the process. Functional exercises are supposed to be stressful and test the real-time response. As with tabletop exercises, functional exercise developers include injects, essentially the curveballs of response, to further test your plans and procedures. Real-time problem solving is part of this type of training. A national level functional exercise was run in 2016 called Cascadia Rising. The simulation was a 9.0 earthquake and a tsunami involving the Pacific Northwest. Emergency operations centers were actually set up in the Northwest and in Washington, D.C. Players were expected to respond to the event and communicate during the exercise play just as they would in a real event. A full-scale exercise is an intense training opportunity with multiple players actually mobilizing their units, their personnel, and even their equipment. This type of exercise involves quite a bit of time to prepare the scenario and can test multiple elements of a plan as a functional unit. Actors may be used to simulate wounded individuals. 
This type of exercise evaluates coordination across and between different responders such as police, fire department, and your facility. Incident command posts are established and the exercise would be fast paced and conducted in real time as it might unfold in an actual incident. These photos are used with permission of the Detroit Zoo who conducts various exercises with their first responders. This is so realistic. Note that the picture at the top of the slide where the signs say training exercise in progress, this is put there so as not to alarm the public. Fire, EMS, police, and zoo all working together. They even had actors acting as victims. A critical component of any exercise, whether discussion based or operational, should involve a post-training evaluation. It's important to document overall performance of all participants, and it's a good idea to record everyone who participated in the exercise. That evaluation allows a facility to improve both their plans and their training strategy. An after action report, or AAR, is part of the evaluation process. It is as important as the training itself. If you learn more about the Homeland Security Exercise and Evaluation Program, or HSEEP process, you will learn that the AAR serves as an official record of the exercise. When an after action report is developed, it should include input from every stakeholder group that participated in the exercise. This is especially critical in a functional exercise where there are first responders and other outside stakeholders involved. Lessons learned from training exercises should be recorded and shared. Sound programs rely on the lessons learned from earlier exercises or event responses. Incorporate those lessons learned to improve your plans, your training events, and other exercises. If you're participating in a HSEEP compliant exercise, the after action report captures those lessons learned. Continuous improvement should be the goal of your training program. How can we do it safer, faster, with better outcomes? Without improving your plans, you cannot be expected to do better the next time. Document the improvements that need to be made in your plans and training. If someone's going to be assigned the responsibility of improving your plans, acquiring new equipment, or changing how you train your staff, you should assign exactly who is supposed to do it and assign completion date goals. That will provide some additional motivation for getting it done. Remember, you only need to train personnel on what you expect them to do in a response. Whenever possible, try to make your training engaging and your exercises realistic and challenging and fun. An actual incident will certainly be challenging. Talk to your local partners, your planning team members, and see how you can train and exercise together. Your facility might be a great venue to host drills and exercises. You'll find that your partners enjoy an excuse to do something out of the ordinary, like coming to your facility for training. Training to your plan must be done, but maintaining your plan is another critical component of the planning cycle. Pull out that plan at least annually, or as new risks or needs are identified. Certainly after every actual incident, or every exercise, review your plan. Decide whether things require updating or changing. Plans that sit on the shelf and are never reviewed and updated as new hazards are identified will not be as valuable. The take-home points for this module are very important, regardless of your business model or the type of collection you maintain. You must train your staff on the plan which you expect them to follow. Training is not enough. To reinforce training, develop an exercise program that can test elements of your contingency plan. Increase complexity whenever possible. Do not be afraid to mess up an exercise. It's better to discover gaps and weaknesses during an exercise than in a real event. Make sure you maintain your plan. Review it at least annually or after new hazards are identified. And make sure that all appropriate parties know that your plans have been updated. So if you stuck through this entire presentation with us, guess what? You made it. We couldn't be happier for you, but... In all reality, the work now begins. You've got to develop a relationship with your partners in preparedness. Do your thorough risk assessment. Look at your needs and limitations and write your plan. Consider how you're going to train your people 
to execute that plan and how to maintain that plan. Don't forget, you're going to need the help of folks that you might not deal with every day. Make sure that you develop a relationship with your state veterinarian. And don't forget your emergency management professionals in your area. They are going to be key partners in preparedness and should help you develop your plans right from the start. The Zap Fusion Center would like to thank the United States Department of Agriculture for funding this very important project. We'd also like to thank the numerous subject matter experts that contributed their time and their expertise to this presentation in any way, either through providing content or by beta testing the modules for us. We are eternally grateful. And finally, I'd like to personally thank Dr. Mark Lloyd. Mark invested countless hours helping us develop this project, provided his excellent narration of the modules. We especially want to thank him for sharing his subject matter expertise and his passion for preparedness in the exotic animal community. Thank you, Mark.